Children's Church. My God. <laughs> and uh, Brother Alex. Brother Alex, can I ask you? We're going to uh, light the uh, Advent <coughs> candle this morning, the pink one is the uh, candle of joy. Previous uh, to this, we the first two candles were a little bit more somber, if you will. The first candle was preparation. The second candle was the candle of hope. Today is kind of a more joyous idea behind the uh, that third candle. And uh, it kind of really fits in with part of our source scripture this morning. So uh, let's look at Luke 2. Verses 11 through 14, Luke 2, 11 through 14. If you're ready for the word of God, would you signify that by saying amen? amen. And if you're able this morning, would you stand with me out of respect for the reading of God's holy word? Luke 11, Luke 2, 11, excuse me. Uh, it begins, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Amen. So previous to this, uh, in our first two lessons, this is a series that will end on, uh, at the candlelight service. Previous to this, we've looked at the proclamation of the good news, how the angel came to proclaim it, and then we've looked at the persuasiveness of the good news, at its widespread nature of its call to all of humanity. So that then leads us to the third point we want to make. The third point is we want to look at the person of the good news, all right? The person of the good news, the proclamation, the per pervasiveness, and now the person of the good news. And that's certainly the, the message of the 11th verse. Who is this child? Okay? We've already noted that this child is our Savior, right? Someone who came to save us from our sins. But beyond that, this is the one who was born that day. He is identified to us as Christ the Lord. Christ the Lord. Now his earthly name was? Jesus. That's his earthly name, okay? That's not given to us here in the Gospel of Luke. You would have to go to the Gospel of Matthew, verse uh, chapter 1, verse 21. It's not given here. But Savior is the equivalent of Jesus. Jesus is a synonym for the word Savior. And so we can understand that. But here, we don't have his earthly name, we have his, the word in your outline is, we have his title. His title is Christ the Lord. Christ the Lord. And that's to be understood. Jesus is both Christ and Lord. He is both Christos and Kyrios. He is, he, is, he is these two things that we will now explain as we go through this this section, and these are very, very exalted titles, especially when you consider a baby who's born in a stable in a food trough. It would be it would be hard to conceive of anyone who's located in the area of that stable that night, where these two teenagers, Joseph and Mary, are taking care of their little baby who's laying in a feed trough, it would be very hard to conceive that anybody looking into the face of that baby would say, that is the Christ, the promised Messiah, the anointed one, the Lord. See, Jesus appears just like every other baby. There's no visible, you know, you see, have you ever seen those pictures with, Jesus, baby Jesus with a little halo around his head? That's not there. There's no halo around his head. He looks just like every other little baby. But when the shepherds are told to see him, how are they told to see him? How are they told 
to distinguish who he is. When they say you will find him out, he'll be, he'll, he'll be wrapped up in swaddling clothes, remember? He's going to be laying in a manger. He's not, there's not going to be a distinguishing mark on him. There won't be a star on his forehead. He's just laying in a feed trough. Not very distinguished. There would hardly be, there would hardly be, would, listen, moms, listen moms, would you want to lay your baby in a feed trough? I don't think so. It would be very, it would be, there would, there would be, this is not the most conducive environment for an infant, for a newborn baby. So this baby, in terms of what anybody might assume about them, this baby, by the appearance, by their surroundings, would be, would not in any way, shape, or form be remarkable. But in fact, this baby, in these very, very, in this very, very, if you will, lowly environment is identified to us as Christ the Lord. So let's talk about him being Christ first. That's a pretty exalted title. Back in uh, the ninth chapter of Daniel in verses 25 and 26, Daniel speaks to this idea and in the Hebrew he uses a word that means anointed. And if you take that word and if you look at it in the Greek Old Testament, that word is then translated to the word Christos. This is the anointed one. This is God's anointed one. That's all it simply means. It's not, don't, don't build a lot into it. It's just God's anointed one. And you know, in Old Testament time, and even in New Testament, even today, have you ever heard of, of uh, you know, when someone is anointed, what does that mean? That, there's, that they are in some way special, that they are in some way set apart, that they're, they're being, they may be being placed in a very high office, giving a, given a high uh, title, if you will. But first of all, the Messiah is the anointed one because he is God's king. God's king, and I use that word, in its, the word God's, in its possessive nature. He is God's king. He is in the line of David, all right? We've learned that through Gabriel when she came to Mary. She said, he told her, you're going to have a baby. And the baby would be, he would be the son of the Most High. Who's the Most High? He would be the son of God. But he would also be the son of David. He would, be, he would sit on David's throne. And he would establish a kingdom. And then he would reign forever and ever as the ultimate king. He is the eternal king. He is the king of kings. And kings, folks, were always anointed. So it's a way to symbolize, it's a way to symbolize that they're set apart, that they're elevated above, that they are in fact distinguished. And this indicates Jesus being called Christos. He is the anointed God's king. Later on in his life, Jesus will be confronted by Pilate, and Pilate will say to Jesus, are you a king? And Jesus will reply, you said it, but my kingdom is not of this world. There'll come a day, there will come a day, when Jesus will reign over a kingdom on this world for a thousand years. Amen? Amen. And then he will reign, of course, after that he will subsequently reign forever and ever as the king of kings and the lord of lords. But Jesus was and Jesus is a king. Matthew in his gospel, all the way through his gospel, portrays Jesus as a king. That's the theme of Matthew's gospel. You know why? You know why? Some of you know why. You can tell us why. This is a test question. Why does Matthew portray Jesus as a king? Who is Matthew written to? The Jews. the Jews. And the Jews needed to understand the Jews, because they were the Jews, had this hang up with the king, right? King David, okay? So the Jews needed to understand that this, this, this person called Jesus was a king. 
But there's more to this person called Jesus than just being a king. Remember, there's other people that were anointed also. People like priests, especially the high priest was anointed. And the one who comes, this Messiah, the one who is the anointed one, not only is anointed because he is the king of kings, but he is also anointed because he is our great high priest. There is only one mediator between God and man, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is Jesus Christ. That's what Paul wrote to Timothy in one of his letters to his preacher boy, Timothy. And this is an anointed high priest, the final high priest, the glorious high priest, the great intercessor between sinners and God, the one who can truly take sinners into the presence of a holy God, the one who alone can give us access, the one who by his death literally severed the veil in the temple that had separated men from God. He is therefore our great high priest. Who takes us into the presence of our loving Father. So when it says he's anointed, if we can sum it all up. First of all, I think in prayer primarily it means he's the one who has come to fulfill Davidic promise. Speaking of David, he is the appointed king, the anointed king. He who will establish a great promised kingdom that lasts forever, a kingdom of Israel, a kingdom from Israel that will encompass the entire world and a kingdom that will last forever in the new heavens and the new earth. But that also implies he is a great high priest. I'll also add he is a great prophet, but I won't speak to that today. But we'll, we'll, we'll look at that in the future. So we know him in this way. This is a little child born in a feed trough who is the greatest king the world will ever know. All summed up, the greatest priest the world will ever know, all summed up in one person, the king of kings. And at this very time, at, it, at his birth, he is as he lays in that manger, he is the king of kings. He is our great high priest, even as he lays in that manger. And that, listen, have you ever really thought about that whole thing? Have you under, can you really understand? It's hard for us to understand how the second member of the Trinity was so willing to humble himself, and he came and left the glory of heaven and he came to earth and he allowed himself to be born in an environment where he, where he would have to be placed in a feed trough as a helpless, helpless, helpless baby. Have you ever thought about that? Have you? He could do, the Son of God could do nothing for himself physically. Have you ever thought about that? That being so willing to, to take on that mantle of humility, which is an example for each and every one of us, each and every day as we walk this earth, as Christians on this earth. <coughs> you know, later on, Luke will uh, comment in his gospel and he talks about how Jesus grows in wisdom, and he talks about him growing in stature. All, he, all he's talking about, Jesus is a little baby, and then Jesus begins to grow, just like, just like, uh, like uh, my grandson JP, just like mine, just like our kids. We're used to our kids growing. <clears throat> Jesus grew up just like a normal kid. He started out as a baby, as a toddler, and he grew to be a a young man, okay? But you, when you consider all the while, even as he, even as he's a, even as he's a toddler, when I had vertigo, I was a toddler. Even as he had, even as a toddler, he was still the King of Kings. Amen. So he's called, you know. He, this is he's called Christos. He's called the Christ. 
and he's also called glory. Now we know we're familiar with that word in a human sense, aren't we? They, I think they do. They still have lords today in uh, Britain. I think they do. They have lords and ladies, and so we're familiar with that term. That's been a, a traditional term in Western society through the years. Someone, a lord, is someone is referring to someone who's in a position of leadership and authority. Uh, First Peter three. Peter writes about, it's even, even, even has some Jewish uh, authenticity to it. Sarah called her husband Abraham Lord. Ma? Sabra, Sarah? Sarah called Abraham Lord. What do you think? <laughs> Never mind. That, that didn't go up. My wife didn't, she didn't. I don't think that went over very well. That'd be cold though. Hey, Lord Steve. You know what she you know what she called me today when I was standing by the door? Hey dude! <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna get that hey Lord. But oh, we're used to that word. Aren't we used to that word? We're used to that word as it's used uh to pretend, pretend, pertain to, uh, you know, just just people, if you will. Uh, but that usage here is, is way beyond anything we're used to. This is this is the Savior, who is Christ, and he's our Lord. And everywhere, that, of course, that's used in the Bible when it refers to Jesus or to God, because it refers to both in the Bible. You'll see it inter, uh, it's used in, in, in a way that can refer to everyone. Anytime you see it, it's a big L, right? Is that an L? From where you're at, is that an L? Or is that an L? Is this an L? I can't, it's hard. I'm, you're all backwards, so it's hard. For me, that's an L. I guess for you, that's an L. But here, this isn't a human designation for a Lord. This is a, in your outline, the word is a divine designation. To say that this child is Lord, uh, is to say that this child is in fact God. Lord is intended, intended to imply in the Greek, all that it implies in the Hebrew word Yahweh. Uh, the word Yahweh where we get to, the, the tetragrammation is used, uh, Y-H-W-H, Yahweh. This is, this is to say that Jesus is Lord, uh, but he is God, First and foremost. And let me say this about that. Let me make sure that you understand this morning. As clearly and as simply as I can state this to you, the most fundamental, the most basic confession of Christianity is this alone. Jesus is Lord. Amen. And anything less than that, listen to me. Because there's people all around us that teach things to the contrary. Anything less than that is sub-Christianity. Right. Amen. That, and that's, that's God's holy truth. You have to recognize, Romans 10 9, you have to recognize that Jesus is Lord. That's right. undeniable. So Jesus, so what does that mean? It means Jesus is God. It means with all that that implies, it implies, listen, it implies his sovereignty. It implies his authority. He's your Lord. You know, we're so Savior-centric in the modern Christian church in America. Oh, Jesus is my Savior. Yeah, he's your Savior. But Jesus is your Lord, and you know what that requires of you? Levels of obedience in your life. You don't get to do it your way. You don't get to say what you want to say when you want to say it just because you want to say it. You have to consider what it is the Lord has for you in the way of obedience. <coughs> That's the good news. The good news is the proclamation of salvation. The good news is the pervasive nature of that salvation. It's for everybody. It's for anybody. And it's at any time. 
And then finally, as we've seen today, the good news is the person of that salvation. It is unknown. It is, it is Jesus Christ, the anointed king and priest. Who is, that's who we're speaking of this morning. Jesus Christ, who is God himself. And that's why when Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 9, he was talking, he was prophesying about the coming Messiah. And he said this in Isaiah 9, he said, A child is born. A son, big S, is given. This is in Isaiah 9. Remember, this is quite a while before the, the, the feet trough. His name is going to be called Wonderful Counselor. What's the next one? This is Jesus. He will be known as Mighty God. Next. Everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. That's who we celebrate at Christmas. Don't take it any, way, any other way. Remember who we're celebrating. There is no question who this child is today. He is God. He is king. He is prophet. And why did he come? Why did he come? Christ the Lord came because he loved you so much he was willing to die for you on the cross. That's the one we celebrate at Christmas. That's the one who calls you to be a member of his family. That's the one that we bear his name as Christians. Amen? Amen. Give me that review slide, Mr. Xander. <laughs> Go ahead and check them for me. Looked at it today that Jesus oh, went too far. There you go. We looked at Jesus as Christ the Lord. We looked at him being the anointed one. God has come as a baby. He is our Lord. But the question for you has to be. Has to be. I like the end of the question. It has to be. Is he your Lord? Yes. 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 What better time of the year to get saved into the family of God than Christmas? It's the 15th. That's an easy day to remember. I got saved in November. I remember. I was thinking about turkeys. <laughs> the turkey got saved. <laughs> Listen, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, why not make it so today? We won't hurt you. All we'll do is love you. If you need to be scripturally baptized, we don't believe water saves you. We just believe it's an evidence of your obedience and in your desire to follow God. If you want to join New Life Family Worship Center, join us. We, listen, if you're looking for perfection, you've come to the wrong place. Because the pastor here is far from being perfect. But we're going to keep on struggling. We're going to keep on doing our best to serve the Lord the way we believe he's placed us in this community to do that. Whatever your need is today, if you just need to kneel at the altar and lift up a prayer to the Lord, if you need to drop a burden into our burden box, how many burdens are in here? Oh, there's a lot of burdens in here. We've never taken any of them out. You know why? Because we don't want you to take them back. We want you to write them on a 3 by 5 card, throw them in there, and never pick them up again. We want to give those things to the Lord. So if you have a burden, maybe there's somebody you don't like. Uh-oh. 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 Be careful now. You know what that causes? That causes bitterness in your heart. And you know what happens to that bitterness? It becomes, a, it becomes a seed that germinates, and then it allows a spiritual stronghold to be uh, taken over and consume you, 
and it impacts your Christian walk. Don't be bitter. Don't be mad. Be glad. Don't be sad. Have joy in your walk today. Praise and worship team. Come on, guys. We're going to give this time to the Lord. We're going to pray. We're going to ask you to, we're going to, ask you to stand with us. We want to thank you for coming. <laughs> We want to give these last few minutes to the Lord. So join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come today before your throne, Lord. We come to lift up our prayers to you. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would fall upon us in a mighty way today. That we would feel you tangibly. Lord, we, we place all those other concerns in our life out of the way. We're not worried about what we're eating for lunch or the bills we got to pay. We just want to have a, a visit with you. Help us, Father, to feel you deep within us. Help us, Father, to call out and cry out to you. Help us, Lord, to be those with pure hearts. And if there's any here today, Lord, that know you not as their Lord and Savior, we lift them up to you, Lord, and we just pray that this would be the day that they would be called to your side. Lord, you are a miracle worker. We see it each and every week. We understand that we don't understand everything, but we know that you are our Father, our Savior, our Lord, the one who wants to love us beyond all human comprehension. Why, oh why, would we ever push you away? So God, be with us this morning as we sing this song. We open the altar and we pray your will will be done. And we pray this all in the magnificent name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <coughs>
like you know that song. That's cool. All those people saying it. Lifting up their voices and praise the Lord. Wow. Thanks for coming. We have a special birthday today. <laughs> Come on, Mr. Wyatt.
like all of this